Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Global Young Scientist Summit. Uh, the first speaker for this afternoon is Sir Tim Hunt. His talk is entitled, Lessons from a Life in Science, How I Stumbled on the Secret of Cell Division. The Q&A session will be moderated by Prof. Eng Shui Yen. Sir Tim, please. <clears throat> I'm not allowed to walk around which is very inhibitory, particularly as I actually can't quite see the slides from where I'm standing. And I must say, this is really quite an intimidating experience for me because I haven't given a talk for, well, since 2019, I think. And I was used to giving, you know, lots of talks. And it turns out that if you don't give talks, it makes you very nervous. <laughs> so the first lesson is give lots of talks. It really helps get over those stage fright things. Second problem, um, I ordered, I couldn't find, uh, and, and, and the last six years we spent in Okinawa, and we just moved back from Okinawa to London. And in that move, my green laser pointer somehow got mislaid. So all I have now is this wimpy little thing, which I barely, can you see it? It is there, actually, but it's weeny weeny. You want something much beefier to thing. And finally, um, compared to the previous speakers, I really am a terrible old dinosaur. Um, the work I'm going to describe to you was done a very long time ago, uh, but it's the story of my life, and I think there are some lessons to be learned there, and I hope you enjoy it, and I apologize for not being up to the minute. Actually, I stopped being a scientist. I stopped running a lab in 2010, and uh, since then, I've sort of, you know, it's kind of interesting. I always thought that Max Perutz, after he solved the structure of hemoglobin, had done something so miraculous and wonderful, but why did, he, why did he go on? He went on until he dropped dead, more or less. Um, on the other hand, Fred Sanger, double Nobel Prize winner, my wife happened to sit next to him on the plane going out to Stockholm. And they fell into conversation, and he said, Oh, I was so glad when I could retire, he said, because it was so hard. Interesting. And everyone was amazed when Fred, because when Fred turned 67, which was the retiring age then, you know, suddenly, the day before he'd been in the lab, the day afterwards, he was nowhere to be seen, and the lab was completely clear. And everyone thought that was amazing. But he'd done so much, you know, and as he said, it was so hard. And I think... Don't kid yourselves, it is hard. It really is hard. My thesis advisor told me, you know, Tim, this business is a, it's a manic depressive business and it's mostly depression. <laughs> As the previous speaker said, you know, I mean, mostly your experiments don't work and most of your time in my line of country is figuring out why and good people are good at solving problems and finding out what went wrong. So my first problem was to find a project, and the first project I chose, um, perhaps luckily for me, didn't work. And after six months of my PhD, I had absolutely nothing to show for it whatsoever. Um, turns out I hadn't read the materials and methods of the paper I was following carefully enough, and I was using the wrong strain of rat. So <clears throat> then I went to uh, my first scientific meeting. And that was uh, what really set me on the path almost for the rest of my career. Yes, for the rest of my career, really. There were two talks. First was an introductory talk by the guy on the left, Henry Borsuk, who uh, talked about two totally unrelated things. One was the control of protein synthesis in red blood cells, and the other was the control of protein synthesis in sea urchin eggs. And the two really have nothing in common. A red cell, after all, is dying, it's lost its nucleus, and it just makes a lot of hemoglobin last 
a uh, few days of its existence, whereas a sea urchin egg, of course, is going to divide and turn into a baby sea urchin. So the two sides are the same. But so the problem, the, the talk that really um, got me started in research was by Vernon Ingram on the right. He was the man who solved the chemical basis of sickle cell anemia. And he was interested in the question of the coordination of heme and globin synthesis. And uh, so here, for those of you who don't know about hemoglobin, this is not actually hemoglobin, it's myoglobin, a closely related one, but the heme is the red thing in the middle and is surrounded by the protein. You can see what protein crystallography was like in those days. This is known as the, the sausage model of hemoglobin for obvious reasons. And you can see that they didn't quite have the connectivity of the chains in, in those days. Why is it doing this to me? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, oh boy. This is, I should say, one of the other things I don't know, I've never given a talk with this computer before. It's sort of <laughs> top of the line and everything, but I ha obviously haven't got it quite set up right. Never mind. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the question was, when does the heme get in? Oh, no. Now the thing is not responding at all. Something is really not right about this. I don't know. Hey, th this is what happens when you haven't given a talk on a computer for ages. Ah, great. So why did that bring it back to life? I don't know. Okay, so um, as you know, uh, proteins are made with messenger RNA, and the question was, the, 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 the heme goes in about two-thirds of the way down. And what Vernon said was that the reason why, uh, if you didn't have any heme, you didn't make any protein was because if the growing chain didn't get the heme inserted, it stopped, it got held up en route. And he presented evidence that that was the case. And I thought that was amazing. Went back to the lab and told my mates. And somebody who was a lot cleverer than I was pointed out that actually his data, if anything, showed exactly the reverse. He had completely misinterpreted his data. So um, we decided that we'd see for ourselves. You know, was it true that when you didn't have any iron around or heme around that the ribosomes formed a Q? And we worked out a slightly better way to do the experiments and uh, we did the experiments. And when I say we, I was very lucky. The guy on the right, Lou Reichart, had worked, he came, he came for a year and occupied the same bench as me and had worked on rabbit reticulocytes in, uh, in Harvard and learned how to do them. And Tony Hunter on the, on, on the left joined the lab a, a year after me, and basically Tony and I collaborated on our PhD and, and, and looked into this business. And then I went to another scientific meeting. This would have been a year later, uh, or even two years later, maybe. And I met Irving London, and he was interested in exactly the same thing. And I eventually joined his lab as a, as, a, as, a, as a postdoc. And by then, we could make cell-free systems from these reticulocytes. That had been invented up the road, unbeknownst to us. Lou was actually interested in the coordination of hemoglobin since he could never get the cell-free system to work. But uh, it turned out to be terribly easy. I mean, unbelievably easy. You, you make rabbits anemic. You then harvest the red cells wash them, and simply add water. And if you add an equal amount of water, the cells burst uh, by osmosis, because they have lots of aquaporins in the cell membrane, and you get a cell-free system which will perform exactly like the cell performed, even though its contents have been diluted in half. Of course, you have to make the salt concentrations right. You have to add an ATP generating system and various other Little, little tricks like that. And as you can see from the graph on the right, if you leave out the heme, what happens is protein synthesis starts off at the normal rate. And it really is exactly the same rate as it would have been in the intact cell, to work out how fast they're moving. Um, 
but and if you add heme, it carries on at the at that whole rate for more or less as long as as long as the, you, you you have the patience to conduct the experiment. And moreover, if you delay adding the heme and then add it back, uh, protein synthesis will recover. So we have a reversible system of control of protein synthesis. Um, and it turned out that there were no cues to be formed, although we also did control experiments to show that if we artificially created a cue, we could detect those cues. So the, the, the ribosomes, in fact, didn't form a cue under any circumstances, and certainly not when you, you left the heme out. Um, it also turned out from some other experiments we did that the heme didn't just control globin synthesis. There are a few other proteins being made in these cells, and they were also controlled in the same way by the lack of heme. So it wasn't specific to the, to the hemoglobin. It was a kind of global control mechanism. So um, <clears throat> I went to New York to, to, to study this, and it was a, a ter terrific thing to do to go to find a lab where, A, I liked the boss, and B, he was interested in exactly the same things as me. He also had lots of money. Those were the days when you know, the NIH grants were generous, and um, it was terrific, and I had a very nice fat salary. I was paid as a sort of medical student rather than as a mere scientist, so that was good. Um, and I liked living in New York. But the work didn't really go very well, and there was only me in the lab. And the boss, it turned out, was about to leave and go and uh, set up a new medical school at MIT. So I had to sort of fend for myself. There was just me and the technician who was about twice my age. She was really nice. She was called Grace Vanderhoff, and she was great. But uh, I found myself doing most of the work, the interesting work, at night when Grace had gone home. So I had sort of two projects, one by day and one by night. And um, at some point, I got so frustrated with the, 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 this, this heme project that uh, I decided it would be fun to have something on the side as well. And uh, I thought it would be interesting. And I realized that I could map the genes in polio virus and, uh, by using the same techniques as Tony and I had developed um, earlier in Cambridge. And so I went to find somebody, and it turned out to be somebody called Ellie Ehrenfeld, who had poliovirus. And I got some poliovirus RNA from her and tried to translate it, and it didn't translate. Turns out this is exactly the right result. Of course, red cells don't get infected with poliovirus, so they're missing factors that cells that do get infected with poliovirus. And later on, uh, colleagues exploited that. But in the process, I sort of thought, well, that must be the case. So what I would need to do is to take, if we know that cells infected with poliovirus are making, uh, translating poliovirus RNA, uh, so all I have to do is get some poliovirus-infected cytoplasm, add it into the reticulocyte lysate, and it will then translate the poliovirus, and all will be well. But what actually happened when I did that experiment was that protein synthesis stopped. And that didn't happen if the cells weren't infected with poliovirus. Normal HeL cell lysates didn't have any effect at all. So there was something in the um, poliovirus-infected cells that inhibited protein synthesis and inhibited globin synthesis. So what was it? Well, that, this was a very funny time of life because at that point, Nixon was secretly bombing Cambodia and a lot of my friends were in danger of being drafted to Vietnam. And it was a very weird sort of political time. We used to have tremendous arguments in the lunchroom. And it almost felt immoral to be doing scientific research when such dreadful things were happening in the big, wide world. But eventually, um, we solved the problem and discovered that tiny amounts of double-stranded RNA were responsible for this inhibition. When I say tiny amounts, a HeLa cell has about 10 million ribosomes in it. And it turned out that just one molecule of a replicating poliovirus, the double-stranded RNA in it, was capable of inhibiting synthesis by all 10 million of those ribosomes. So it had to be catalytic. There wasn't room on the strand of RNA for all the ribosomes to bind. I mean, you, that could have been one of the, the theories. So it must be sort of, it, that was weird. How, how could double-stranded RNA make a catalytic inhibitor? 
And I discovered another thing too, which had a, a similar effect. Um, and it wasn't really a very successful postdoc. I mean, the, the discovery of double-stranded RNA actually did, that was a nature paper. In those days, you could publish quite short nature papers and uh, you didn't have to have 58 supplementary figures and all that jazz. <laughs> Uh, I think this, it's a retrograde step now. I think, uh, anyway, let's not go there. Um, but Jim Watson had a very good piece of advice in one of his books. He says, always try to work with people cleverer than yourself. And that, I think, is excellent. I always try to do that. So I went back to Cambridge rather with, you know, I, 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 I didn't know what to do with myself. And uh, I took a five-fold cut in salary. That was something quite extraordinary. I'd been on $11,500 a year in 1966 dollars, and I went back to a salary of 800 pounds. And I was supposed to pay my national insurance fees, and uh, I didn't realize that. I was self-employed, although I had a college fellowship. And, I, and, and eventually, I, the, the, the Department of Stealth and Total Obscurity caught up with me, and this guy in a raincoat came and said, why aren't you paying your national insurance? And when I told him how much I was earning, he said I was quite right. <laughs> with, the, with the result that my old age pension now is only two thirds of what it would have been had I been contributing to the pension scheme back then. But it's, that's, anyway, so Richard and I joined forces, and Richard fortunately had a, 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 a junior appointment, they're called demonstrators in Cambridge, and um, had a lab, and so, and, and, and Tony Hunter was still around. And we discovered that it was the same with the heme lack, that uh, an inhibitor of protein synthesis, the formation of an inhibitor was what was responsible for the turning off of protein synthesis, and that inhibitor blocked the initiation of protein synthesis. And Richard and Tony had recently discovered that protein synthesis was initiated with a special methionine-carrying tRNA, and it was the binding of that tRNA which was the step that was inhibited. So that suddenly refocused our thinking. In other words, before then, we'd been studying things in quite the wrong way. We didn't really focus on the inhibitor, and we didn't really know what step in protein synthesis was inhibited, and we knew nothing about the process of initiation of protein synthesis. And uh, I won't g go into describing it because at this stage the lab burned down, um, which you might think was a setback. It was actually the best thing that could possibly ever have happened to us because um, there was a wonderful insurance policy which said that we could have everything new that had previously been old. and. Um, not only that, but we moved out of the old biochemistry department up the road to opposite the laboratory of molecular biology. Um, and the result was that at, at that point we were actually terribly confused about what was going on. We had a lot of data. Luckily, the two graduate students had just graduated and written their thesis, so they weren't affected in the least. We lost one paper's worth of data. Everything was burned up. I mean, absolutely everything. It, the, the fire was so hot that it even melted Pyrex. Uh, and they, they, they were these flasks sort of looking like that. Amazing. So, uh, as I say, we went up the road, and it was a teaching lab in the hematology department opposite the famous laboratory of molecular biology. And Max Perutz, who was then the director of the lab, was very kind to us and said that we could use his stores and perhaps even more importantly, uh, have lunch in his lunchroom, which was run by his wife. And uh, that was fantastic because the lunchroom had all these fabulous scientists and you'd sit down at lunch and Francis Crick would come down and explain what he was uh, thinking about. It was nucleosomes at the time, and I got on very well with the people in John Gurdon's lab and had some collaborations. Sidney never went to lunch because he and Mrs. Bre and Mrs. Perutz didn't get along. Uh, and, uh, and so I knew all these people, you know, and, they, I, they, and, 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 and not only that, but they, they, as undergraduates, they'd given us lectures in Cambridge. I mean, this was a fantastic privilege, actually, and you realized as a result, I mean, you know, Fred Sanger, for example, absolutely fantastic scientist, but not a very good lecturer. Um, rather boring. 
even, even Max was, fan was, was not a very inspirational lecturer. He would, he would come in and his assistants would bring the, the then model of hemoglobin. It was a great contraption with wires and things all stuck together with sticking tape and solders and stuff. And he would stick it on the bench and it was five o'clock in the afternoon. He would then turn out the lights in the lecture room and with a torch in focus on particular, look at this moussin residue, he would say. You know, it's fantastic. It's only two angstroms away from. <laughs> and uh, I just fell asleep. <laughs> so I didn't really care about that leucine residue and how far it was away from the. Yes, but anyway, but I mean, and, and so what one sort of got to know was that there are an awful lot of different ways of succeeding in science. And I, it would be hard indeed to say what these people, and, and not only these people, but look at the, the list of people down at the bottom who. Who, who followed on, who were not Nobel laureates at the time. Um, as I say, I got on very well with people, at not, not John, well, I do get on pretty well with John Gurdon, but I was mostly, at those days, talking to his, his students and, 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 and postdocs. And, um, you know, uh, there are, they were a quality lot, but we didn't consider ourselves in the same league as the Sangers and Peruzzi's and the Brenners and the Cricks and... And, 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 and so forth. We were just young scientists trying to figure out our particular problems, and we would discuss them over lunch and over dinner and try to help each other and make sensible, intelligent suggestions. Uh, and so the uh, uh, previous speaker's um, you know, point about cross-cultural interchange, I, th I think very, very valid. You know, people would just make random suggestions that were extremely, extremely helpful. And you just sort of keep trying and putting one foot in front of the other. And if I had to say what was sort of um, these people had in common was that they really liked to understand things properly and, if possible, simply. Uh, you don't, don't try to be too clever. When you really understand things, they're usually very, very simple at heart. What looks very complicated at first is actually very, very simple. Anyway, uh, maybe as a result of all, all this, and maybe also as a result of, sort of burning all the previous data, so we had to sort of had a fresh start with fresh equipment, we quickly solved the problems and found this inhibitor was a protein kinase that phosphorylated the initiation factor that bound the initiator tRNA to the ribosomes, and that was a sort of great res re resolution. And so a problem, I guess this would have been about 1975, so roughly a decade from having first identified the problem, we solved the problem. It's a very good example of a very good problem because it's a clear question, you know, how does heme regulate protein synthesis? The answer is it uh, somehow uh, controls the formation of inhibitor, which is a protein kinase, which phosphorylates something and that inhibits the action of the thing. So um, we now know that actually uh, there are four of these enzymes and one of the other ones, we actually, I think, really solved it by uh, studying double-stranded RNA and how that, uh, how, how, how that worked, but not all the others are the same. And the one we missed was the unfolded protein response. So it was complicated, and the reason why heme and double-stranded RNA, which are two incredibly dissimilar things, w inhibit protein synthesis the same way is because they, 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 there are, if you like, receptors for those things which control protein synthesis. And nowadays, this is actually a quite, quite a growth industry. I mean, I, I stopped working on, on this way back then, um, and it, it turns out that the global control of protein synthesis is, is through this this mechanism. And, um, but it presents a bit of a problem. If you're working on a problem and you've solved it, what do you do? Because it's silly to keep on working on a problem that you've solved, right? Now, of course, there were lots of things you could have done. I mean, we should probably have purified these enzymes and studied them in minute detail and got their 3D structure and stuff like that. But that's really, it wasn't very interesting compared to the, to the main main point. So we, we organized an EMBO workshop to discuss um, the control of protein synthesis. And I remembered that lecture I'd heard from Borsuk about protein synthesis and sea urchin eggs, and I wondered, 
what was known, I mean, it would be interesting to study, in, in the case of the heme control, it's really um, when the heme stops being made, the protein stops being made. It's quite important, that, actually, because otherwise you make a lot of protein that precipitates and you get anemia and kind of stuff. But um, what was known about the turning on of protein synthesis in sea urchin eggs? And I knew from the literature there was this guy called Tom Humphreys who uh, worked on protein synthesis in sea urchin eggs, and he worked in Hawaii, so we invited him to our meeting. What I didn't know was that he was a very keen cyclist, which I was at the time, and Tom said, where can I rent a bicycle? And I said, I'm afraid there isn't, there wasn't at that time anywhere you could rent a bike in Cambridge, so I lent him my bicycle, and as a result of that, uh, we became friends. And what I also didn't know was that he directed the embryology course in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, the Marine Biological Laboratory, and he said to me, why don't uh, you come next year and help teach the embryology course, even though I knew no embryology, and we can do some experiments together on sea urchin egg protein synthesis. So I leapt at the chance and went there, and actually that first summer I learned quite a lot about sea urchin eggs. I also learned a lot about what they didn't have at this lab, which was anything you needed to study protein synthesis. So <laughs> there was no, there were no um, liquid nitrogen, there was no Revco, no minus 80. In fact, all they did was to fertilize eggs of various different phyla and watch what happened for the following week or something like that until you got little swimming embryos. And, I mean, that was, that was nice. Also, there was, a, there was an Elvis impersonator on the Cape at that time, and we all became groupies and went and listened to and danced a lot. And there was also a, a, a pub which was stayed open and served pizza till midnight, which was very handy because you could sort of just end the lab at about 11.30 at night and then go and get pizza where you were quite hungry by then. So we worked, we worked pretty long hours, and then there were lectures starting at 9 o'clock the following morning. And uh, there was a guy called Stan Cohen who worked on the EGF receptor, and he taught me a very important lesson too, which was that um, it doesn't matter what you're doing in biology as long as you have an assay, and Stan's assay was the premature opening of baby's eyes, baby mice's eyes, so he would take his column fractions and inject them into baby mice, and the active fractions were the ones where the mice's eyes opened a day earlier. You know, I, 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 that blew me away because biochemical assays to me um, were just things like, you know, solutions turning yellow or blue or something like that. And uh, the idea of the baby mice is eye opening, so it was very useful. Anyway, it turned out to be easy to get sea urchin eggs, and um, it was also true that when you fertilize them, the, the rate of protein synthesis went up tremendously by a factor of 10 to 20. As this, this is an actual experiment that I did. And, um, but the more important thing that these uh, eggs do is divide. And if I fertilize this egg, you'll see what I mean. This is tremendously speeded it up, of course. So, but not, I mean, it's tremendously speeded up, but these divisions actually take place at about half hourly intervals, even though the temperature of seawater is maybe 18 degrees. I mean, this is spectacular. In other words, these eggs are super specialized for cell division. And um, I went back year after year trying to understand how protein synthesis was turned on and began to wonder about this cell division business. And uh, in 1979, uh, collaborated with um, Joan Ruderman and her graduate student, Eric Rosenthal, um, studying the control of protein synthesis in clam eggs. Now, clam eggs are a little bit different from sea urchin eggs. They don't, you don't see a huge increase in the rate of protein synthesis, but what you do see is the, the, is the gels on the middle thing, is that before and after fertilization, there's a really significant change in the patterns of protein synthesis. They start making proteins in which we were able to show the messenger RNA was already in the unfertilized egg, but it wasn't translated until after fertilization. Uh, and we call these proteins, imaginatively enough, A, B, and C, and wondered what they were there for. 
And uh, this was Eric's PhD problem, and I thought that was a great problem to figure out how these, this, the translation of these messages was, was controlled. And that summer, uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting out of, out of scene. And this, this is what a, a, a clam egg looks like before and after fertilization, taken by the same kind of microscopy on the left in black and white, on the right in, in color. And I think you can see, let me see if my pointer can point. Yeah, there's the pointer. Those are the chromosomes. This is, a, this is the first meiotic spindle. There's a one spindle pole, there's the other spindle pole. And this is before fertilization. You can see an amazing structure, and uh, that structure totally breaks down. I mean, there is a total transformation of the cell by the act of, 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 of fertilization. And what is the biochemical basis of, of, of that? And this was absolutely unknown at the time. And then that, that same summer, um, there was a lecture in the one afternoon by John Gerhard, who was a very distinguished enzymologist, and who had become very interested in frog oocyte maturation. I've just shown you clam oocyte maturation. Frog oocyte maturation is, is, is very similar in what's going on. It's uh, meiotic divisions. And um, if I, it, it had been discovered that progesterone was the hormone that causes maturation. So an oocyte, by the way, this is something I didn't really... An, uh, the oocyte is something... In a f it, the females in the audience will understand this, but I didn't really. The oocyte is the thing in your body which is going to become an egg. Uh, and it has to undergo a, a, some meiotic divisions and various other processes on the surface before it can be fertilized. So uh, in the case of the frog, uh, I will now show you what it looks like when you add progesterone. To the thing there, the progesterone has gone in. This is again very speeded up. A white spot forms, and that convulsion at the end is actually the first meiotic division. And um, what John described was that uh, something was known about this because uh, Yoshio Mazui, who was at the time he did these experiments, a postdoc in Yale. Um, had discovered that what progesterone did was to cause the formation of something that he called maturation-promoting factor. And the way that he discovered that was that if you take um, a mature egg, that's the first thing on the right up there, and you suck out a little bit of its cytoplasm, 50 nanoliters or something like that, and inject it into a second oocyte, now the second oocyte responds as though it had seen progesterone, but much more quickly. Um, instead of taking several hours, it takes sort of one hour or something like that to undergo the same uh, transformation. And so the question is, what was that substance? And um, what was MPF? Well, it was difficult to say because it was terribly, terribly unstable. And if you tried to purify, it just went away. And it turned out that, for example, if you added a bit of ATP to the buffers, that helped stabilize it a little bit, but not really. It was destroyed by heating and it was destroyed by digestion with proteases, so it looked like a protein, so therefore probably an enzyme. And again, I was amazed by this concept that there could be an enzyme that catalyzed cell division. I mean, that sounds crazy, right? I mean, you know, it's, that's... Cell division is not a biochemical reaction. It's a much more complicated thing. And um, not only that, but it turned out that uh, all cells in mitosis have this, and you could assay that in the frog oocytes. It was a difficult assay, but it could be, could be done. And um, it goes up and down. It appears, and it only appears when cells are dividing. It does not appear in between times. So um, these eggs are dividing. I wonder, do sea urchin eggs have MPF? And we thought about trying to assay it. And I began to think about you know, the control of cell division. And I also thought, what a delicious problem finding out what MPF is. And um, then I did an experiment, which was designed to test something completely different, namely are the patterns of protein synthesis in fertilized eggs the same as the patterns of protein synthesis in parthenogenetically activated 
And this was, a, in some ways, a, 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 an experiment predicated on my religious upbringing. The idea that you could do a biochemical experiment on virgin birth was quite extraordinary to me. And I liked the idea that you could make sea urchin eggs develop parthenogenetically. I mean, you just had to add a, a calcium ionophore was the most reliable way of doing it. So I did the experiment, and this actually is not the first experiment. This is a rather clearer second experiment that I did. But I think you can see the, the protein label cycling. So you label the eggs and you analyze the proteins on a one-dimensional jar. And you can see that cycling is one of the most abundant proteins synthesized early on. And then it went away. And then it came back again. And then it went away. And we could show that actually for the entire, during these rapid cell divisions, it was coming and going on a, on a, on a regular basis. And it's a little bit clearer here. We then went and looked at the clams. Now, Eric and Joan had never done this experiment, so they didn't know that proteins A and B went away. But they do, very clearly. Uh, and so from studying the control of protein synthesis, uh, I switched to studying what the hell this protein was, how it went away, and why. And um, that uh, occupied... I mean, it, 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 we were very slow and stupid, actually. <laughs> so, uh, but then you're in a terrible position because you've been an expert in one thing and now you're a complete ignoramus in another very complicated field. And luckily for me, very little was known in those days about the control of the cell cycle. So uh, I, I read about it, I chatted to friends, I said, is there anything you see wrong with the idea that this protein which is going away might be its part or something to do with the enzyme that catalyzes cell division? And you know, when it goes away, it's because you don't want to be dividing anymore. And nobody could pull any holes in, in, in that idea, but they all thought I was crazy. So the, 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 the point of this really all is, 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 is DNA and um, the moment of absolute enlightenment, the reduction of biology to one dimension, as Sidney Brenner said. It's a matter of replicating the, the tape, the, 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 the program that uh, controls life, and then putting a new copy of the tape into the two daughters, daughter cells. And it, it's worth going back and reading von Neumann's papers on making automata, cellular automata. So that's the cell division cycle, um, replication of DNA, segregation of the chromosomes at uh, mitosis, and gaps in between the two processes. So what can one say about that? Well, very little at the time. Um, Lee Hartwell studied the genetics and uh, focused on a gene called CDC28, which controls start, that is to say, uh, the, the initiation of replication. And Paul Nurse studied CDC2, which uh, apparently controlled the entry into mitosis. And so it looked like they were two different things, and it came very surprising when they were cloned to, fi to, to find that they were interchangeable. But in this, the genetic experiments doesn't tell you anything about the physiology, and there was no hint that proteolysis might be involved. And I th should say at this point that um, nobody had ever suggested that proteolysis was important for the progression in the cell cycle because it would have reg been regarded as impossible. Proteolysis is something that occurs in your stomach, if you degrade one protein, you can degrade them all. The idea that you could degrade just one protein specifically at a particular time in the cell cycle, and no, moreover, we'd established that this stuff, this cyclin, was only unstable at the end of mitosis. It was perfectly stable protein at the other time. So this, it had extraordinary properties, and we couldn't conceive of it. But, there, but that's, what, that's what happened, so we had to study it. And the, the, the answer came from um, biochemical experiments done by Jim Mahler, who sort of changed the assay and used an unhydrolyzable form of ATP and succeeded in purifying um, MPF. And it turned out that MPF was a complex between cyclin and CDC2. CDC2 was a protein kinase that without the cyclin had absolutely uh, no activity. And so 
Paul and I who discovered that Paul, I remember wandering around a, a field in, in, a, in a meeting and he said, no, it's not a protein kinase, we've tested it and it has absolutely no activity. And it just didn't cross our minds that our protein could have been an activating subunit because at that point, you, only inhibitory subunits of protein kinases were known. I mean, it, 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 I, I cannot tell you how bound by prejudice and preconception one is. And, you know, it, it, it's... It, 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 but it's hard to shake yourself out of that until you actually do the experiment and you're forced to, to change it. It's awfully easy to be theoretical in biology and you have to be uh, practical. So that was the answer. And, you know, once you understood it, it was really simple. The cell makes cyclin, that turns on CDC2, that catalyzes entry into mitosis. At the end of mitosis, you degrade the cycling, the CDC2 turns off, and you get on with the business of, of replication. What, you know, what was, you know, what was your problem before? Um, but at the time, nobody understood it at all. And so I was incredibly lucky just to, make, to stumble on this dis disappearing protein and to enter a field right at the beginning when nothing whatsoever was known, and I think I should stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, team. Now we will have a Q&A session moderated by Prof. Um, thank you. Um, please take a seat here. Thank you, sir, team, for sharing your life lessons in science with us. It was very inspiring. And to the audience here, please do not burn down the labs to try to get new equipment. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. So um, in the interest of time, maybe we can take about three questions from the floor. Anybody would like to go ahead? I see a young gentleman here. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. I'm Patrick. I was just wondering, um, with the burn down lab, would you say that's a stroke of luck, or it's also related to a mindset of turning adversity into opportunity? I think uh, it was a, Yeah. I mean, when it happened, it, it was, a, it was a, a stunning blow, right? I mean, you know, I mean, it was... Was the, the funny story is that uh, Tony Hunter kept these wonderful lecture notes and he had filing cabinets full of lecture notes. And we went into the lab the following morning and he opened the filing cabinet and supposedly the lecture notes burst into flames. So he shut them again. Uh, um, you know, you just have to deal with it. I mean, it didn't occur to me what a, what a benefit it was at the, at the time because we just had to focus. I mean, things would happen like... Um, oh gosh, where are we going to get an ultracentrifuge from? So I called up Beckman and they said, oh, we're going to send three of these things to ICI or somewhere. You know, well, they wouldn't mind if you had one of them. And so people were incredibly, we had such a wonderful sob story to tell that people were incredibly kind and generous and helpful uh, <coughs> to us. But it was really that move, I think, which was the even more important thing. But we did have a wonderful new lab and a small lab. It was very, it was, and it sort of brought us together too, I suppose. All right, thank you. Thanks for the question. I think there is a second question coming up. Hi, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, you mentioned that you were sort of inspired by a lot of people um, in Cambridge when, when you, you stayed there. And uh, I, you know, it's hard to not notice that they were all men, for example, and white men also. And I was, you know, just wondering if you could comment on that and maybe give some inspiration to people that do not look like the, the people you've met and yeah, you got well, inspired they, from. They, they, I did emphasize that two of my collaborators were, were women along the way. And I think things are changing now, actually. Alison, is Alison here? Uh, that they've just appointed the first woman professor in <laughs> Oxford. <laughs> um, uh, you know, because when I was growing up, there were increasing numbers of young women coming through. It just takes time, I mean, it, you know, to, to go through the pipeline before you come out the, out the other end. And um, it had not been... I mean, there were, there were okay, there was, I think there was one woman lecturer in our department. And there were some famous people. Um, oh gosh, you know, the, the crystallographer in Oxford, who was the, the, the woman who did B, vitamin B12, um, Dorothy, Dorothy Hodgkin. You know, so they, 
They weren't unknown. I don't think there were any sort of... I, I would have said there was no bias against them, but, but for reasons, presumably societal reasons, they didn't, they didn't do it. But it, 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 this is a very touchy subject, and, uh, you know... Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry if, uh, if the question is a bit... Uh, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> I, I, I mean, you're absolutely I right. I just wondered, I, you know, yeah. all, those, all those people were, were men. Thank you. And, we, you know, one should ask why. And is it, is it good or bad or...? Yeah, it's open question, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> good question. I have to agree, this is also a work in progress, and I'm very glad to see that there are equal numbers of uh, men and women, females versus males in the crowd here. Uh, moving on to our third question, and probably Hello, our final thank you. question. Thank you very much for your talk and your story. There's something that you've mentioned at the end of your talk, and it's that <clears throat> you felt that you were bound by prejudices, and that kind of you find it hard to break free from what what's kind of um, the standard or the or the the um, status quo on the on the field uh, and i think that's co that's something that comes a lot in a lot of breakthroughs and a lot of things that are holding up a great scientific discoveries is these biases so what's your best advice from your experience <laughs> to young scientists to kind of break free from well, I, I guess don't be afraid to think differently. I mean, and if, if, but you need the clues, right? I mean, you need to be drawn in the right direction. And you, you, it's, it's so important to keep your feet on the ground and not go further than the actual evidence. But it does help to dream. I mean, I, why, I, one of the things that I, in retrospect, I find very hard, you know, a lot of the pioneers in this, in this cell cycle field were really, really fine scientists. I mean really clever, clever people. And nobody, nobody, nobody ever thought about this. So it wasn't, it wasn't just sort of, you know, it was sort of collective, collective blindness, collective biochemical blindness, just from looking at an example, a lone example. I mean, we should have known, we should have known better. Thank you. Okay, the last question over here. Uh, hello, I'm Ram. Um, you mentioned also about the prejudice, but I'm interested in uh, uh, validating the results because you mentioned that uh, signs are putting you in that direction. Yeah, that uh, that breaks the prejudice that you have. Um, were the results that you have before? Uh, did you try to ask someone to try the same experiment and? Let the and led to the same result because sometimes, sometimes oh. we, we we get a failure and just sometimes we uh, just doubt ourselves if we're doing the experiments right, <laughs> right? Well, uh, let me tell you, I you know uh, a point I didn't make was that this is it was a really bad research project in one respect, which is that the material sea urchin eggs are only available for one month of the year, and. So you could only do a month's worth of experiments, and then you'd come back. And I was terrified I'd come back the following year. Would it still be true? So the very first thing we did was just to repeat the experiment. And I was so relieved when the protein still went away a year later. And of course, we, do, we tried. I mean, uh, one of the things I, I didn't mention was that, you know, first we, we, we did this with sea urchin eggs, and then we wondered whether it happened anywhere else. And I persuaded a student in the lab, this was a, a, a summer course, whose project wasn't going very well, that he ought to look in clams to see whether uh, anything went away in clams. And we were delighted when we found that these two proteins went away in, in clams. So we, we were pretty confident that, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't an artifact. And in, in any way, the way the experiment was done, it was, it was hard for it to be an artifact. I mean, you couldn't really be, be fooled. It was a very robust experiment. I was very used to doing that kind of experiment. So I sort of... Those, those things that I showed you, I was very good at reading them by then. I, you know, if you're not, then they wouldn't mean so much. And indeed, I, I slightly congratulate myself. I think, you know, I, I, I do regard myself as a bit of a fraud as a Nobel laureate because all I really did was to see this protein go away. And the first time the protein went away, it didn't really go away terribly convincingly. And, uh, uh, but I, it, nevertheless, I don't think anybody else would have noticed except for me. Put it that way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Sir Tim and Prof Hung.